Welcome to today's webinar about chronic nature of eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, featuring Dr. Carla Davis of Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. My name is Jennifer Roeder. I'm a communications consultant for AppFed, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We are pleased to have Dr. Davis join us today. She is a professor of pediatrics and chief of the Division of Immunology, Allergy, and Retrovirology in the Department of Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine, as well as the director of the Texas Children's Hospital Food Allergy Program. She's the principal investigator on over 20 epidemiological studies and clinical trials in food allergic disease, and has mentored several pre and postdoctoral trainees in the last 15 years. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Denver. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today to speak with um, the AppFed community. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the chronic nature of uh, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders. And um, as um, Jennifer mentioned, I'm a chief of the immunology, allergy, and retrovirology section, a professor of pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine. And, um, and today, um, you, you probably saw in the description um, for the chronic eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, um, they include things like uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, um, and, and they are chronic conditions, meaning symptoms might be ongoing and needing routine care. So um, while they can be controlled, uh, as you know, there is uh, no cure. Um, however, um, we're going to talk today about, you know, how common they are, the different types of um, EGIS, and how do the symptoms present, you know, it's, if it's a chronic disease, then, um, then what happens and um, over time, and there are some patterns that we see um, as, as uh, from, from uh, infancy all the way up to um, the elderly. And uh, how do you determine the best course of treatment? I'm actually going to talk about how uh, I, as a physician, determine the best course of treatment in partnership with, um, with my patient. And then uh, what happens when uh, we don't treat the condition, but then also what happens um, if treatment is stopped? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about um, an exciting uh, new development uh, also in terms of treatment. So inflammation occurs in eosinophilic gastrointestinal uh, disorders, all of them. And the, the reason why they're called eosinophilic is because this eosinophil allergy cell is the one that's causing this inflammation along with other, other factors. And so I like to think about inflammation like a wildfire. It, it um, can be uh, only in the ground, kind of like a smoldering um, on, this, on the surface, uh, or really actually underground, right? We can't really see it that much. And then, or it could be um, on the surface, so a little bit more, you know, that there are degrees of inflammation, or it could be um, crowning, meaning it's, it's just, whew, it's really, really severe. And um, this is another way to just see and visualize um, that there are degrees of inflammation. And um, the reason why I think this is so important is because in a chronic disease, uh, inflammation can uh, be, uh, it, it can move from, uh, from the ground to the surface, the crown, back to the surface, the ground, and, and treatment should, uh, should really be personalized in order to um, give enough treatment to suppress the inflammation that's present. The other um, thing that I, I thought about um, that it might be kind of like um, Bruce Banner, you know, he's kind of a calm guy, right? Um, but if, uh, if he gets stressed or if he gets angry, or, um, you know, needs some, some uh, strength or something, right? He, he, can, he can get inflamed, right? He, he can become the incredible Hulk. And, uh, and so I think that um, in eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, um, as a physician, I, you know, I'm always trying to get that inflammation down so that just happy, like Bruce Banner, smiling, and not uh, like uh, that that Hulk situation. And and really, I think that there is um, a uh, kind of a happy medium. 
because I lost twice. First Hulk lost, then Banner lost. Then we all lost. No, you didn't hear first. I did. For years, I've been treating the Hulk like he's some kind of disease, something to get rid of. But then I start looking at him as the cure. 18 months in the gamble. I put the brains and the bra on together. And now look at me. Best of both worlds. Excuse me, Mr. Hulk? Yes. Can we, can we get a photo? 100% little person. Come on, step out. You mind? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Say breathe. Did you get that? That's good. So, um, so as you see here, right, there, there's this, uh, this, these two conditions, right? Bruce Banner, he's got uh, brains, he's like really kind and nice and calm. And then the Hulk is this just inf inflammatory, you know, and, and, and they're kind of going back and forth. But, but in this clip, we see that, um, that he has, uh, has made what I call the smart Hulk, right? So he's combined them. And, and I think about uh, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease kind of uh, like that, like, like we, so I know that it's really unlikely that the inflammation in eosinophilic, somebody with eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease is gonna completely, you know, everything is gonna go away where it's uh, all back to normal. But if we can get to a stage where um, the inflammation is controlled enough that there's not um, symptoms, no, um, uh, uh, difficulty with uh with feeding good you know quality of life then um then i think you know it's kind of like you know um the best of both worlds we're, we're controlling the inflammation and uh, we're getting you know a great um uh quality of life so so we, we've just got to get to the uh you know decrease that hulk piece knowing that he is kind of always could either come up or just a little bit but but really getting to a place where uh, symptoms are well. I lost twice. So let me just uh, yeah. So how can we get to this uh, smart uh, Hulk situation? Um, this is in and or how can we get to uh, the forest, not not the the fire situation that we saw earlier? So let's um, go back and just look a little bit at um, really what these disorders are. So you'll you'll notice that um, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders are considered um, kind of EOE or non-EOE, and and in this particular picture, it shows that eosinophilic gastroenteritis is um, is the non-EOE, and and it all is just dependent on the um, the location right in the gastrointestinal tract. So um, so the red here is this is the esophagus, and in eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, this area is inflamed. But in the lower part of the gastrointestinal tract, the other areas um, are inflamed. And so it could be that, um, that we have the stomach that's inflamed, um, that is eosinophilic gastritis. Um, we could have the um, duodenum, which is this little part here, uh, that's inflamed, or the other parts of the small intestine, and, and that's called eosinophilic gastroenteritis, or, or EGE. And then this uh, part that's kind of square-like is the colon, and so this is considered eosinophilic colitis. And, uh, and so um, it is definitely, uh, uh, th these two entities um, can uh, present in a little bit of a different way we're, we're learning. And, uh, and the, we're still uh, sorting through um, how to treat the lower part of the gastrointestinal tract. But we do know that, um, that many of the same uh, mechanisms that cause the inflammation um, are present in, in eosinophilic gastroenteritis compared to eosinophilic esophagitis. So what's happening? How many patients have it? Well, um, if we look at the incidence, uh, which is how many new people are being diagnosed uh, yearly um, uh, versus the prevalence, how many people just have it 
uh, in the population in general, we can see both things um, over time with these multiple studies have shown that it is increasing. And, um, and so we know that we are detecting it more because we know about it, but we also really believe that this rate of increase is higher than um, would, would occur with just um, you know, increased detection. So, so, um, so we know it's increasing. And when we look at um, the age and the gender of the distribution, this, this graph um, talks about eosinophilic esophagitis, but then all of these other, in, in the uh, lower panel, all these non-EOE eosinophilic gastrointestinal diseases. And so the male um, uh, patients, uh, the number of patients are in blue and the female number of patients are in pink. And um, the graph is going from um, zero to four, so little toddlers and infants on the left-hand side, all the way up to our elderly um, uh, patients on the right-hand side. And, and so you can see with the number of patients um, for eosinophilic esophagitis, there, there is a, a, what we call male predominant. So, so um, de definitely less female patients have it. And, and if uh, female patients do have it, if women have it, it's, uh, it's kind of in this middle range. In contrast, non-EOE EGIDs um, actually are more evenly distributed among um, men and women, girls and boys, and, uh, and it seems to be really predominant um, in, uh, in the lower uh, age range. This study comes out of um, a national study in J Japan. So, um, so we're always wondering, okay, well, what about the United States? Um, uh, in this particular study in Japan, um, the odds of having uh, eosinophilic esophagitis and all um, uh, eosinophilic gastrointestinal diseases showed that um, there was uh, uh, odds of four times higher of, of having male gender. But in the United States, uh, this really uh, mimics this, uh, this picture. 57% um, of male patients have this eosinophilic esophagitis and, uh, and then 45%, so less male patients have the, these other um, entities. Eosinophilic gastritis is EG, EGE is eosinophilic gastroenteritis, and then EC is eosinophilic colitis. So, um, so when we look at these, uh, the gastritis, gastroenteritis, so this gastritis is the stomach, gastroenteritis is the small intestine, and colitis is the colon. Um, we can see that um, compared to, and I'm going to just go back for a second, compared to um, the, the number of, of patients here, which is, um, you know, around uh, 20 oh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to go back one more. The incidence, uh, the prevalence, I should say, of uh, eosinophilic esophagitis is, uh, is around somewhere between like 30 to 45 um, people per 100,000. In contrast to that, when we look at eosinophilic um, gastroenteritis, um, you can see that the, the numbers of uh, patients per 100,000 is really smaller. So, so they're uh, less common, only um, six, eight, and three uh, pa pa patients uh, it, per 100,000 persons you know, have these disorders. So they're, they're relatively uh, rare. And, um, and it seems that eosinophilic gastroenteritis is the most common. This is, this is United, in the United States. So um, what about the symptoms? This, this chronicity of disease can, um, can really uh, be shown here. There's, there, the symptoms of diagnosis in children and adults are different. And um, the proportion of patients that have um, this, this uh, word called dysphagia, which is just a difficulty swallowing. And, um, and so this, as you can see in this graph, goes up over time. Um, the other things that tend to go up over time and are more seen in adults compared to children um, is the food heartburn, the food impaction and heartburn. So food impaction is just where food that's swallowed gets stuck in the esophagus. And, um, and so uh, this, this is a consequence of the inflammation being there for a long time. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, also growth failure um, and food refusal, as well as vomiting, seem to be higher in pediatric uh, populations and tend to go down um, over time. 
um, from the from the Japanese study, just comparing um, the uh, non eosinophilic esophagitis, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease. So so taking away the um, esophagus. Um, we can see here that there are some differences uh, in the symptoms uh, on presentation. Um, it seems in the school age uh, group, there's significantly more restriction of daily life activity. We know this contributes to a poor quality of life. Um, in children, there's more of this growth failure weight loss that's coming from the food refusal. Um, and surgical treatment is, is, uh, is higher in the, uh, in the younger kids. Um, interesting, blood eosinophilia was the same across the um, age groups, and, uh, and, uh, but, but low protein levels and loss of protein seems to be higher in children who present with eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease um, in the lower gastrointestinal tract. Um, when, we, when we look at um, you know, EOE compared to the non-EOE, uh, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, you can see what, what kind of pops out is that um, the, there is a more restriction of daily life activity in the, the lower, when the lower gastrointestinal tract is inflamed and there is um, more uh, growth failure and weight loss. Um, the, the eosinophils in the blood are higher. These are these allergy cells that are in the blood that, that are contributing to the inflammation. And, um, and then this, this low protein level is seen when um, the lower gastrointestinal tract is inflamed. So what about uh, in the United States? Well, when um, the uh, US Consortium of Eosinophilic Gastrointestinal Researchers studied patient registry uh, data collected from 2015 to 2018, they found some interesting um, things. And I encourage you, if you have not signed up for a patient registry, you know, we're still learning a lot about the chronicity of um, this disorder. So you and your, um, or your child's uh, experience will help us understand really what, uh, what's uh, happening. But of 17, uh, 715 patients who had an eosinophilic gastrointestinal uh, disorder diagnosis, more with eosinophilic esophagitis versus these non-EOE eosinophilic gastrointestinal diseases, um, a higher proportion of those with, 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 that did not have eosinophilic esophagitis had more frequent symptoms, including nausea, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, constipation, and bloating. So um, the, ad additionally, these patients had tiredness, um, some, some more isolation, and, and pain, interestingly. And we don't really understand everything about this. This is a relatively recent information that we're learning. Um, I love this slide that, um, that really looks at um, the causes and the, the, the um, ending of the inputs into you know, what causes this inflammation in eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, specifically eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, it, you you kind of have to be genetically predisposed. And if we think about the Hulk analogy, right? He, he um, uh, was in the lab and so uh, his DNA got changed. <laughs> We'll just say the gamma rays changes DNA, right? And and um, and so there's some genetic abnormalities that that predisposed to um, having this inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract, um, and so causing this inflammation of cells and um, an inflammation in the actual lining of the esophagus. Um, but there are these. If you think about Bruce Banner again, when he gets um, angry or um, excited. Or, um, or mad or sad, he, he, can, he can change the whole, right? So inflammation comes when um, the exposure to certain foods, we know that that can cause the inflammation in a, in a group of patients. Um, also breathing in uh, pollens and what we call aeroallergens, things in the air um, can, can also cause this inflammation. And then other environmental factors actually might do it as well, um, like um, pollutants, um, antibiotics that may change the uh, bacterial composition of the body. All of this uh, can are, are inputs that, that can cause this um, inflammation and the inflammation is seen here 
um, in this lower uh, box that says inflammation and can cause um, um, some uh, furrows, which are um, little grooves um, in the uh, lining of the esophagus and they're, they're these linear grooves. And then there are rings that can be seen that narrow the esophagus. And, um, and then these white patches um, are evidence of cells that are causing the inflammation. If this goes on for a long time, then, um, then again, a narrowing of the esophagus can be seen in this little white uh, line here is showing uh, an esophagus and it should be much, much larger than that. This is another way to just kind of look at it. You know, this inflammation, this chronic nature in eosinophilic esophagitis as well as eosinophilic gastroenteritis um, is, it, it, you know, it can be different in different stages and uh, different severities. So, um, so this is a normal, um, you know, um, esophagus when, when a, a a scope or a, a tube is put down to look at the um, the line the the lining in the lumen or the the uh, space uh, here, and then we, we take a piece of the lining of the esophagus and look at it under a microscope, and it looks like this under a microscope if there's no inflammation. But if, if inflammation occurs because of food, pollen in the air, allergies, um, and then uh, other environmental factors as well as with this genetic predisposition, then, um, then the cells uh, come into the lining. And this can occur, of course, in, in children. We use medical and dietary therapy um, uh, significantly in children. And, uh, and then over time, you can see here these lines um, of um, what look like rope um, are representing um, uh, collagen, which is, um, Kind of the structure that uh, that uh, makes uh, things um, strong in our body. Uh, there's a lot of collagen in our skin, and uh, and the more this uh, these fibers uh, are coming into the esophagus, the um, the less flexible the esophagus is. Because when we eat, um, when we take a um, a piece of food and we swallow it. The esophagus has to stretch open and then close uh, in order to move it down to the stomach. And, and that does not happen um, very well uh, in, with the inflammation that stays there for a long time. And so uh, there's a procedure called esophageal dilation where a, um, a, a nice little um, cone is placed uh, surgically into the esophagus and to, str to stretch it out and open it up. So um, when that chronic uh, inflammation, when the inflammation is there for a long time, um, kind of like with the forest wildfire um, analogy, right? If you let that inflammation on for a long time, it just like burns everything to the ground. You just can't see anything. And, and in this particular case, uh, you know, things get scarred, um, less flexible. And so then people start to have swallowing difficulty and choking. And these, this is a, a, a graph that shows on the left-hand side, uh, lots of studies that have been done in children and adults. And, uh, and looking at the, um, the proportion of adults in these studies and children in these studies that actually have this swallowing difficulty, difficulty getting the um, food down. And you can see that it's just much higher uh, in adults. And we believe that this is because um, that inflammation has uh, progressed and, um, and there's definitely um, uh, this, this fibrosis, these fibers that are uh, developing. But, um, but we're learning more about um, you know, what, what happens. What we think is, you know, in, in little infants, they're feeding difficulties and in uh, children, there's poor weight gain, vomiting and abdominal pain and some, some difficulty swelling starts as, as uh, uh, they, they grow or the inflammation is there for a longer time. We, we know that, that uh, there, there are some um, groups of patients that may, uh, may have feeding difficulties and kind of stay there. Uh, some that have uh, strictures early on. So, so there's some variations to this, but in general, this is the pattern that we see um, with chronic eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease. I wanted to share just some ways that we as physicians that I um, assess uh, whether the inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract is you know, chronically there or not. 
And this is a, a, a questionnaire, a dysphagia symptom questionnaire that just um, uh, has some of the questions that I would ask a patient who, uh, who comes into uh, my office. So since you woke up this morning, did you eat solid food? The answer is yes. Um, then since you woke up this morning, has the food done, gone down slowly or been stuck in your throat? And, uh, and so the higher the score on this, the more symptoms there are and the more likely that there's inflammation. Um, and then for the most difficult time, you had swallowing food today, which is during the past 24 hours. Did you have to do anything to make the food go down or to get relief? Well, um, many, patients with eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorder, specifically eosinophilic esophagitis, have to do things to get it to go down. So um, sometimes it clears up on its own, but many times uh, patients have to drink liquid, cough or gag, um, vomit, or even go to the emergency room and get the food removed uh, surgically. And so um, the other thing that can happen is pain. So um, this question talks about the amount of pain experienced when uh, swallowing and what's the worst pain that you've had over the uh, past 24 hours. And you can see if the pain is severe, then that tells us that this, uh, this, these fibers are, are, uh, are limiting the distensibility of the esophagus, not letting the esophagus stretch in order to let food go down. And in little kids, um, if, if I'm thinking about uh, a chronic, uh, you know, chronic concern, then, uh, then I ask these questions, you know, does it take longer to eat than others? Do you need to cut food in small pieces? You always need to drink with meals. Now steak and crusty bread are really, really significant triggers of this, um, these symptoms. And so, um, so, you know, asking about steak is interesting that hamburger doesn't really do it as much. And, um, uh, you know, uh, soft bread, <laughs> not as much, just crusty bread, hard bread, and then steak tend to, um, to cause these symptoms. Um, so sometimes uh, parents also will, will tell their children, you need to chew, you need to chew your food because it just gets stuck. But it's actually the, the disease that's causing that, not them not chewing enough. Um, and then uh, not wanting to eat because it causes pain. Um, or is, is your child a, an extremely picky eater? Um, there are many things that can cause picky eating, but, but this is one of them as well. So, um, so in order to, uh, to diagnose and monitor this uh, chronic eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease, um, I focus on uh, eating and swallowing patterns. Um, if a patient has uh, more symptoms that are, it's telling me that there's this uh, fibrosis, scarring, uh, narrowing of the esophagus going on, then I'm thinking that it's, it's really uh, uh, more chronic and, uh, and we need to be more aggressive in treating. Uh, and then we talk, I, I look at the physical examination, focusing on growth and nutrition uh, parameters, uh, and, then, and then looking at the, this endoscopy, which is the procedure to look in the esophagus in order to get these uh, pieces of the lining called biopsies. But we focus on looking at the way that the, uh, the esophagus looks visually um, with the tube and then under the microscope. So how do we determine treatment? How do I determine treatment? And how can you work with your physician to determine treatment? Well, it depends on the severity, right? So here we have Bruce Banner, you know, he's just beginning to, uh, to transform and, um, and he transforms to, uh, you know, has, and has different stages. So what I'm doing is I'm assessing based on symptoms and, uh, and any results from biopsies that may have been recent, these endoscopies and biopsies, you know, how severe, what are we along this continuum? Um, you know, are the symptoms really severe? Um, how about the histology? You know, how many, um, uh, furrows, how many rings, you know, how, how narrow is the um, esophagus? And um, we're still learning about the lower gastrointestinal tract and how to, uh, to determine severity of disease. Um, so uh, also the eosinophil count is, uh, is one of the ones that, uh, that is used for diagnosis. And, it, and, uh, and it's different in every uh, different area of the um, gastrointestinal tract. So the gastrointestinal tract um, normally has eosinophils um, to, to a, a higher degree in the lower gastrointestinal tract. Um, and in the esophagus, typically there are no um, eosinophils. Um, I apologize for the, um, the, 
the phone, I, I could not actually uh, stop this uh, or turn it down. Um, but the eosinophil uh, count, if it's greater than 15 or equal to 15 in the esophagus, then, uh, you know, then that's, that's uncontrolled eosinophilic uh, esophagitis. Um, also, I want to minimize side effects um, of the treatments that are being utilized. Um, we know that food avoidance can cause nutritional defects. Um, also, um, we know that a steroid treatment that's topical can uh, result in um, some uh, absorption in the body that, that could impact the bones. And so I want to make sure that uh, bones are strong and, uh, and, and what stage is the um, inflammation so that we can minimize it. It's a balance. It really is uh, a balance of uh, looking at the severity of disease versus uh, the side effects. So um, I wanted to bring up the fact that atopic or allergic disease can occurs in, in most of the patients that have inflammation in the esophagus. And this, these three graphs are showing um, the patients that were diagnosed um, in the different part of the year, the different quarters of the year from January to December on the, um, the bottom. And, um, and looking at <clears throat> um, what was happening with the pollen counts in the, uh, the air. Um, and, and for these patients were allergic to grass, trees, mm -hmm. and weed. And, um, and so the diagnosis of um, their disease and the inflammation tended to flare during the season where that pollen count was high. And so this can be uh, an even more um, uh, confounder, a confounder in the um, the the symptoms. When I look at chronic disease, you know, I'm always trying to say, hey, look, um, we want to do an endoscopy uh, in a season, preferably where my patient is not allergic, in order to get a sense of what's happening um, on the treatment. So. Um, kind of in, in, in summary, I want to just move into the uh, treatment, how, how we treat a little bit more details. This is an algorithm, just a flow chart of how doctors um, look at um, the, the, the treatment after for, for eosinophilic esophagitis. But I'm telling you, this um, paradigm is uh, similar for the other eosinophilic gastrointestinal um, disorders. The only difference is that um, in the lower gastrointestinal tract, um, food antigens and dietary avoidance are not as, as big of a contributor. Um, so we typically go with medications. But um, after we identify this disease, then an allergy referral can help control environmental exposures and, um, and, and allergic diseases that are present. Um, and then the, um, there are three options for treatment. One is a proton pump inhibitor or a, a reflux medication. Um, one is dietary therapy or avoiding foods. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. The other is what we call topical corticosteroid or swallowed steroids, not pills that you swallow, but, but um, I'll talk about, you know, it's, it's either mm -hmm. an uh, inhaler or, um, or a liquid that would uh, go slowly down the uh, esophagus. And, and then after a period of time of um, treating with those in interventions, then repeating to see what, what's happening with the inflammation. Is the inflammation um, definitely going down or is it, is it not? Um, if, there's, uh, if symptoms have uh, gotten better and the um, histology has gotten better, then you know, let's push on with the same uh, therapy. Um, if, if the side effects are, um, are not tolerable or we see side effects, well, maybe we need to reassess. Uh, and, and, and if we've removed a lot of foods, maybe we need to add those back um, and, so, and see if that works. Now, if the symptoms are persistent with those uh, treatments that we've tried, then, uh, then we have to talk about, you know, are, are, are you actually taking it every, every day? It's, it's tough to take medications every day, but we know that 
um, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease, they just don't go away. And so, um, so when a patient feels better and says, hey, I got to just uh, you know, I don't think I need these medicines anymore. Uh, we see over time that the inflammation builds back up. And so um, we can uh, add medications. If there's reflux going on, we can uh, take away more uh, foods, um, change to, uh, to another different type of steroid. And then uh, biologic therapies are uh, shots that can be given in order to dampen the allergic response. Um, I, I mentioned esophageal dilation that can be utilized with this cone to stretch out the esophagus to make it bigger so that um, choking in this word called dysphagia is not happening. I'm just going to share some of the results of studies with these uh, three therapies and what happens um, for with if, when uh, the dietary and the steroid therapies are stopped. So um, this is these are graphs of um, uh, studies that show esophageal um, biopsy results with the eosinophils. Uh, in the, or this is one on the left, is the eosinophils that were seen in a in the microscope, under the microscope, and in, in a high power field, and one one circle when you look in the microscope, and um, and so before the uh, reflux uh, treatment, um, the the eosinophils were higher, and then uh, afterwards they they dropped down in most patients. There were a few that went up, but most of them dropped down, and then. Um, looking at EOE score, this from a different study, uh, and looking at, so this score was symptoms. If, if uh, patients had a lot of symptoms and they had a higher score, I'm sorry, if they had, a, if they had more symptoms, they had a lower score. If they had less uh, symptoms, then they had a higher score. And so the score went up uh, with the proton pump inhibitor. And so, um, so that was a, a good, uh, good sign. And the long-term response um, looking like six years after tr uh, starting this, um, it really is a range. And so um, uh, I think at every visit, if a person with eosinophilic esophagitis, and it typically works mainly for the uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, not the gastroenteritis, um, then every visit um, you should discuss with your doctor whether this is, this is still needed, am I still responding? Um, the steroids to treat EOE are, um, uh, we have two, fluticasone, which is puffed and swallowed through this meter dose inhaler over on the left-hand side, a little puffer, uh, which is used for asthma, but we're, we use it for um, eosinophilic esophagitis. And, and uh, we, I want to make the point, you can't use this discus. Sometimes doctors will, will um, order this, but with this discus, powder comes out and you have to inhale it. And, and that is not going to go into the esophagus, it's going to go into your lungs. So, um, so it has to be uh, this puffer that can, you, that can be activated, it puffs into the mouth, and then you swallow. Uh, Udesonide is a, a real thick suspension, and, uh, and it's, it's shown here, and it comes in little respules and uh, little individual packets. Um, and then uh, Splenda is, or, or some kind of thickener like sugar, uh, can be added to it to thicken it up and take it once a day. Uh, and then there are these systemic corticosteroids. If, if you know, things are severe, if we have weight loss and having to go in the hospital, if the esophagus is narrowing, then, um, then we're going to need to go to some, some pills that are uh, higher, uh, stronger, definitely stronger. So what happens if you stop the treatment? This is a study that looked at uh, patients that were on those steroids and, uh, and stopped um, and, um, and looked at, you know, when did the symptoms uh, recur? So at the beginning, you know, on the left-hand side here, for all of these, almost everybody, almost 100% had uh, no symptoms. And then over time, and it took less than a year for at least half of them to have symptoms come back. Even in the patients who were on these two steroids, you know, did it make a difference if you were on one steroid or another? Everybody had this recurrence of these symptoms if they stopped the treatment. It took, um, you know, about a year for about half of the patients. And then, you know, looking at whether the patients had that stretching of the esophagus, dilation or no dilation, it really didn't make a huge difference. By, uh, you know, about a year, half of the patients uh, had symptoms again. 
patients that had more severe symptoms, recurrent symptoms, I mean, they basically none of them at a year um, were symptom free. So we know that when you start, this disease is chronic, when you stop, it's gonna come back uh, within you know, six months to a year, the inflammation and the symptoms. What about diet? So in food elimination, well, um, food elimination is very effective. This is the first study uh, done, 10 patients. They were given uh, an amino acid-based formula, and this says eosinophil counts, and, uh, and then they were treated <clears throat> with this just uh, uh, non-protein-containing uh, amino acid formula, and, uh, and look at the, the inflammation just bam, it just went down significantly. And so now, We've gotten a little more nuanced and we've figured out that pretty much six foods, if you avoid those, you know, not everything, you don't avoid all foods, uh, but just six foods, you can actually uh, get a pretty good response in about three fourths of patients. And that those foods are cow's milk, egg, wheat, soy, nuts, and seafood. And, uh, and so we call it the six food elimination diet. And, uh, and we've gotten where we can uh, tell that if you avoid four foods, cow's milk, egg, wheat, and soy, about half to two thirds of patients will respond. If two foods are avoided, which are the most common foods that trigger this inflammation, it's cow's milk and wheat, um, and that, that uh, is effective in uh, about 40% of patients. And then if you just avoid, you know, uh, a third to half patients will actually improve the inflammation, going back to Bruce Banner from the Hulk, um, by just avoiding dairy. So, um, you know, is it, is it better to try the two, four, six or st start strong and go back? Well, I think it's a, it's a shared decision between the patient and the provider. And so um, this is uh, showing the two food elimination, uh, the uh, going from two food to four food if, if the pe people didn't, patients didn't respond. Um, and then if, if that didn't get a good response, going to the six food. And so you can see here, it's just a stepwise progression. Um, and so this 92% of food triggers were identified. Um, so what proportion of patients actually um, uh, had uh, food triggers? And, uh, and the patients that, um, that had you know, five food triggers, they, they really needed the, that six food elimination diet uh, over there on the right-hand side. Um, of course, the two food elimination diet uh, worked for those that had one or two um, food triggers for their eosinophilic esophagitis. What happens if you reintroduce the food? Well, it causes return of symptoms. So there was a study that looked six years after um, uh, uh, initiation of treatment in 562 patients and only 11 patients had resolution. Reintroduction of the foods and stoppage of all medical therapy caused reintroduction for all 551 other patients. So, so really, um, this this is a chronic disease. And um, if you looked at, at this uh, particular study, looked at uh, the the patients that had this uh, total resolution, but then also some patients that had outgrown some food allergies. Was there anything that could predict, you know, were there any differences? Um, and, uh, and it seemed that um, the age at diagnosis was about six. So these are children typically. Um, follow up was about five years. Um, and, uh, and the number of foods for these patients was a little bit lower uh, than those that did not grow at these food triggers. So but again, um, if you have eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease, we, we really have no evidence that uh, it's, it's going to resolve. Um, 10 years of follow-up in, in a pediatric um, eosinophilic esophagitis um, uh, group um, looked at you know, 10 biopsies every year and found that there were three different kinds of responders, patients that, some that were complete responders um, in, that had low inflammation, you can see them in the red, and, and that they, they just responded to treatment right away within um, a year. Then there were incomplete responding uh, patients that just, you know, just didn't get quite below that 15 eosinophils per high power field uh, threshold. And then there were the non-responders that just, you know, we treated and, and didn't get a response. And uh, interestingly, this EGID score, right, um, just in non-responders, um, it, it, it tended to, uh, to get worse. So symptoms uh, tended to be a marker for whether in the inflammation was, um, was getting worse. Um, interestingly, a higher proportion of, um, of girls 
um, emails were uh, didn't respond and we don't really know why. I wanted to talk about the new treatment. Um, this is, I'm really excited about this. Uh, Dupixent, Dupilumab uh, was approved by the FDA as the first treatment for eosinophilic esophagitis, uh, chronic immune disorder. And, um, and this is given in a weekly subcutaneous injections. Um, it can be given up to 300 milligrams to treat patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, age 12 years and older, weighing at least 40 kilograms. We still need to, uh, to work on a great treatment for um, lower gastrointestinal uh, inflammation. We do, we can use uh, corticosteroids at this uh, point and, uh, and dupilumab is being studied uh, for those disorders. Uh, this is the first medicine specifically indicated to treat eosinophilic esophagitis in the United States. So really excited. This is a preliminary study uh, out of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that looked at patients who were being treated with uh, dupilumab for other things like asthma or eczema and, um, and looking at the EOE uh, before and after. And I mean, it just really a great response to decrease the inflammation there. And the EREFs means um, <clears throat> the endoscopic score, how the, the esophagus looks. Um, and that also got much, much better. So um, in conclusion, uh, about the chronic nature of EGES, you know, the, the, we're seeing more and more of patients that are having these disorders. Uh, the inflammation can range from mild to severe. Symptoms range from mild feeding difficulty or abdominal discomfort to, to choking, inability to swallow food or eat. And the effect of treatments reduce the acid. This is a proton pump inhibitor or a PPI um, in the stomach. They de decrease the inflammation. Um, this, this can be achieved by swallowing steroids um, or having food avoidance and uh, decrease the allergic pathway that causes the disease, and that is dupilumab. There's no cure. We just saw that stopping treatment really results in the return of symptoms, not right away, but it will come back. And so um, as a physician, I try to balance treatment impact, quality of life, and side effects for long-term control of eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders. So I do believe that in the future, and, and also if you work with your physician, you can go from this crowning inflammation to a more calm forest with uh, minimal symptoms. Uh, I think you can go from, you know, the Hulk inflammation to a calm, smart Hulk that can have the best of both worlds. No, it was great, you. kids. Thank you very much. Oh, go, Bruce. Damn, Bruce. Listen to your mom. She knows better. Thank you, no, thank you, no it was great, you. kids. Thank you very much. So I, I want to tell you to, uh, you can take control of eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders and and work with your physician. Hook out in a smart way, knowing that the inflammation is there, but uh, can be controlled. And, uh, and I'm happy to take questions uh, at this time. Thank you so much for having me. This Thank is you. our endophilic gastrointestinal uh, disorder. This is our group at Texas Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for all the information and all the wonderful analogies. It really helps put things into perspective to kind of understand what's going on inside our bodies. Okay. We have a uh, wealth of questions coming in for you today. Not surprising, a number of them about Dupilumab. Um, so let's, let's dive in. Alrighty, if you have EOE and EG, can you get approval for the Dupilumab to treat the EOE? If so, would it, basically, if you get treated for EOE with Dupilumab, could it also help EG? Yes, and so, um, there's actually a study going on right now um, because there uh, have been some preliminary studies that show that dupilumab has an impact on EG. And so, um, so yes, your physician could um, order and the dupilumab for the EOE and you may get an impact on the EG. We don't know that, you know, the, the, the definitive studies haven't been completed, but because you know, allergic inflammation in the entire body, it contributes, uh, it's, it is possible. What if your child tries to pick scent and you don't see an impact? What do you recommend then? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think if you don't see an impact, then I don't think there's um, a reason to continue the medication. And we know I talked about different groups of patients that have um, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, and some people, some some are not allergic. I mean, it's it's not 100% of uh, eosinophilic uh, gastrointestinal disease patients that have this allergic pathway. So it may be something else that, and, and Dupuy may have specifically focused on that. So there may be something else. And so, um, so you would need to, I, I would say, you know, discontinue it with you know, talking with your physician to make sure that, you know, everything's been covered in terms of making absolutely sure that what you can't see, like the inflammation inside your body, um, is, uh, is also not responding because sometimes the symptoms can um, uh, continue, but there's, it, there's improvement in the biopsy. And so you just want to make sure that um, that everything is really not responding and, and talk to your physician, but you could stop it and then move to another treatment. Let's see. So there's a variety of different treatments that you talked about today. Is there a particular reason that someone would be prescribed budesonide versus the inhaled steroid? And would one work better than the other? Oh, that's a great question. So there have been studies. Um, they, they are really fairly comparable, um, but the studies that look at them side by side um, for the budesonide um, in children, it seems to be just a little bit you know, more effective, but that's only a very small amount. So for instance, reticosone might be like 60% effective, budesonide is 70% effective. So I don't, I think that um, when I think about the two medications, I think about um, the fact that they have to be taken on a regular basis. And an and ineffective medicine is a medicine that doesn't work with the lifestyle of my patient. And so, um, so I would really think about, um, can you take the medication? The budesonide takes a little bit of um, uh, preparation before you take it. If that's just something that's not good with your lifestyle, then going with fatigazone is way better. Um, there also have been quality of life studies that have been done, and uh, in the fluticasone, because in, in adolescents especially, um, people who are active, because they can take it around with them and, and be more consistent, um, is, is definitely better for quality of life. So, so I think that there are pros and cons to, uh, to both of them, and it needs to be a shared decision um, with the patient and the physician. Another medication that's coming up in the questions is Jorvisa. Not sure if I'm saying that one correctly, um, but curious, they are curious about the protocol for maintenance dosages. For Jorvisa? J-O-R-V-E-Z-A. Let me see what the um, specific uh, generic name, J-E-R. J-O-R. J-O-R. Mm -hmm. V-E-Z-A. So this um, looks to be something that uh, was in the Europe, first European. Uh, this may be, I don't know if, if we have some international people who are on the line. Very possible, that's all right. We can um, do some, look for some more information and we can follow up, um, but yeah. definitely oh. talk with your doctor about yeah, your specific dosages for, for any treatments that are being discussed today. I, I can actually uh, share, I mean, I, you know, I just brought it up. So it looks like this is a budesonide tablet um, that was uh, approved by the European Medicine Agency. Um, to date, there is, uh, is no FDA approval, um, but, um, you know, it's interesting that there have been studies of budesonide, not only, so there was a, a study in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. of budes this budesonide tablet, and I don't know if it's the exact same formulation, but um, the um, FDA did not approve it, uh, but there was some small efficacy in, and I didn't talk about the study in, in the, um, the patients, and so there is a uh, a, uh, a move to try and engage with the investigators who did that study to engage with our governmental agencies in order to talk about getting that um, approved. Um, I think, again, um, the, the steroids are effective and what works best is what works with your lifestyle that you could take it on a regular basis to address chronicity of disease. So you talked about a variety of different triggers and how they can impact um, different conditions. 
Could a food be a trigger for EOE and yet not an actual food allergy? Yes. So depends on really what the, um, I would say yes to that question because um, food allergy, the definition that I'm thinking uh, the person is asking is the kind of food allergy that causes hives and swelling, coughing, typically immediately after eating a food. And, uh, and that's an immediate reaction to food. But in eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, we know that there's a cellular response to food in the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. And this is more of a delayed response that does not immediately cause symptoms. So yes, you can have a food trigger and not see immediate symptoms um, of a classic food allergy. A follow-up question from a different individual. Um, they've heard that lower EGIDs often have more or multiple triggers in comparison with EOE. Does that align with what you've seen? So um, I would say that the lower gastrointestinal uh, disorders have um, non-food triggers, <laughs> so is, is what I would say. Um, you know, the early studies uh, looking at an elemental diet, just drinking um, uh, amino acids without any intact protein um, did not show as big of a difference in the EGIDs, uh, the EGE, lower gastrointestinal tract inflammation disorders. And, uh, and so in, in select patients in cases, um, milk seems to might, you know, be one of the food triggers, but again, it's, it's much less common than an EOE in the esophagus. So, so triggers could be, we, we haven't really sorted out actually, honestly, the, all of the, the triggers of, of Egypt. Lower Certainly. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Can EOE cause any coughing fits, particularly at night? So um, definitely it can cause coughing fits, absolutely. Um, if the coughing fits are occurring during the nighttime, I get more concerned about uh, reflux, something that the, like the acid is coming, up. something's happening at night in order to cause that. If food is eaten close to the time that someone goes to sleep, then, um, then there can be inflammation that causes um, some of the acid, you know, reflux type uh, symptoms. So, um, so I guess overall the answer would be yes. It's more common for these coughing fits to occur right after someone has eaten. Have you found, are there any um, relation between allergens and constipation? So constipation um, can occur, I didn't, I didn't talk about this, but allergic proctocolitis is, um, is what happens when there's inflammation in the rectum and the, around the anal area uh, in, the, in the very terminal part of the gastrointestinal tract. And constipation can occur if there's inflammation in that lower area. Um, milk, uh, you know, and we can, can be some triggers, but again, it's, it's uh, more common in infants or uh, very young children uh, for cow's milk to be a trigger for this. But um, overall, the answer is yes, but um, we, we still need to learn more. And, um, but, but the best way to figure it out is doing the elimination diet. And if it gets better, then this reintroduction of the food to see if it worsens again. Um, it's sometimes when we, when we do an elimination diet, if things get better, we don't know if it's just a coincidence or not. So we try to reintroduce just to make sure that, um, that we're really uh, avoiding something that needs to be avoided. Okay. Circling back to the discussion about Dupixin, um, if someone is, are there medications that someone should stop if they are taking Dupixin? For example, if someone's taking PPIs, um, if they were to start Dupixent, should they stop those PPIs? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it depends on the impact of the Dupixent. So if uh, there's complete resolution of symptoms and significant decrease in the inflammation, then uh, yes, you should consider talking with your doctor about stopping the PPI. Uh, medication because um, really um, you only need enough medication to decrease inflammation and, and improve symptoms. You don't, you don't want to take more medicines than are necessary. 
there's been a number of questions that have come in also about follow-up. How often do you need to be seeing your doctor if things are under control? How often do you need to get a scope? Um, what's the balance between doing follow-ups and being stable? Can you speak to uh, many of those questions? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I shared some uh, six-year and 10-year follow-up studies. And um, because of the chronic nature of eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, um, the, uh, it is very easy to have control and be on medication and then kind of back off. And, um, and so I, I think if um, you're well controlled, you know, every one to two years, just to check in with your doctor. And if you um, think that um, there needs to be a backing off of some of the medication that you do it in conjunction with your physician to make sure that you're really under control um, from a uh, his, you know, tissue standpoint, that, that there's no inflammation in your gastrointestinal tract. So um, I recommend really at our center one every year follow-up. Um, and we do endoscopies every one to two years just to make sure because it's, you know, when you don't have... Um, immediate feedback, which doesn't always happen if you stop a medication or stop or eat, you know, some food that you're not supposed to eat, you don't always get immediate feedback that that's not a good thing. It may come over time over months. And, uh, and so, so I do think that every one to two years is, is really uh, a good check-in uh, point just to make sure that what you're doing is still working and that you're really under good control. I hope that answers most of the questions. I think it does. Thank you very much. And we have so many questions in here today. Um, if we could, we can perhaps we'll follow up with you, Dr. Davis, to be able to get some additional answers, questions answered. But thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Um, it presented invaluable information to help so many people be able to manage different situations that they're in. I'd also like to make sure that we take some time to thank our education partners for their support for today's webinar. In particular, thank you to both Abbott and Bristol Myers Squibb. Also wanna remind people about some additional opportunities to be able to learn um, and connect with people through AppFed. We are gearing up for our annual patient education conference. It will be from July 7th through 9th. And this year we are returning to in-person in San Diego. At the same time, we will also continue to have a virtual component and we'll be streaming all of the sessions. Um, there will certainly be several social aspects of it that will not be streamed, um, but we are very much so looking forward to gathering both virtually and in person this summer. There are other opportunities to connect with people such as the online community through the Inspire Network. You can check that out by going to appfed.org slash connections. We also encourage you to listen to our podcast, Real Talk Eosinophilic Diseases. In the most recent episode featuring Kayla Abramowitz, we talked about growing up with agents. So there's definite connection to all of the discussion from today. So thank you once again for joining us for APFID's EOS Support Webinar Series. And thank you, Dr. Davis, so much for such a wonderful presentation. I hope everyone has a great day. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.